Thank you to everybody that uh, showed up for this um, curriculum class on being a 1099 employee. Uh, the woman that I'm going to introduce has all of the credentials. She's a certified public accountant, a certified fraud examiner. Um, she's the best in the biz at what she does. She's the Graffiti Park and the Graffiti Park Foundation accountant. Um, she also happens to be my mother. Everybody, <laughs> Kelly Bullions. showing up. At first I thought I would just be talking to Dominic. So, uh, but uh, this is exciting stuff, huh? 1099s and taxes. Um, if anybody didn't do theirs, the deadline is October 15th, which is coming up if you uh, filed an extension. But um, you can, uh, like, are all of you who I'm talking to, are you currently 1099s now? You, have you gotten any 1099s, any of you? On your last tax return, you had 1099s, 1099s? I actually got a 1099 for a job that I worked for that I did not know I was gonna be 1099. Yeah, that can happen sometimes. Yeah. So the way you know, and we'll talk about that, is if they ask you to fill out a W-9, and then you'll right. know that you'll get a 1099 for it. So, and then most of you then are W-2, and sometimes you can be, do both, W-2 and 1099. So. But a 1099, the difference between being an employee and being a 1099 independent contractor, they call it, an employee, you get a paycheck, you'll fill out a W-4. I think Kitty uh, put a, a thing of what a W-4 looks like. So the W-4 employees withholding. So if you're gonna be an employee, they'll ask you to fill this out. And that's got you know your social security and everything and then how many dependents you may have and that you're going to get a paycheck and on every paycheck they're going to take tax money out of it so that at the end of the year when you go to do your taxes you've already paid hopefully as you know much as you need but if you're an independent contractor they're going to give you a w-9 and that's the same thing asking what's your social security number your ein on your company and then they will give you a 1099 at the end of the year if they paid you over $600. So, and one thing that can be confusing for people, sometimes say you say you work for somebody and um, they're gonna pay you $1,000, but then they're gonna reimburse you for your supplies. You have to go to the store and buy paints and brushes and everything like that. So they pay you 1,200 of which $200 is reimbursement for all the stuff that you bought. They will 1099 you for $1,200. And a lot of people say, well, that's not fair. You only paid me $1,000, the 200 was all the pain. It doesn't matter. Your 1099 will have the 1200 and then it's up to you when you do your tax return to show those receipts for that $200 so that you're not taxed on that $200. So that's why it's really important for you to keep all your receipts and everything that it costs you to do the job. So, but that's the difference between an independent contractor. There's um, in Nevada, it's called the one, two, three test. California, I think Kitty said it was ABC, but um, basically a lot of people are like, and am, am I an employee or am I, am I an independent contractor? An independent contractor would be, the criteria is you have to have a social security or EIN. Everyone should, you know, have a social security. Um, it's often you have to have a special like license or or require insurance so like independent contractors would be maybe like i'm a cpa so i have a special license that people would hire me for um or a special you know skill set and then a lot of times you need to have your own workers comp policy um i think uh, we looked up sometimes it's kind of hard to get workers comp policy but if you are an independent contractor and somebody has you go out on their premises to do a job and you fall off the ladder and get hurt, you're supposed to have your own insurance that protects you for that and will you know, pay your medical bills. It's not on the person that you're doing the job for. So if you're an independent contractor, you are responsible for your own workers' comp policy to make sure that if you get hurt on the job or if anybody you hire gets hurt on the job, that they are covered. So. Um, and then the final test is there's like five or six items and you have to meet at least three of the criteria, but they're basically, are you told how to do your job? So as an employee, usually you get a job and they say, you're going to come in, you're going to be a server, you're going to work these hours, you're going to wear this uniform, you're going to report right here, you're going to make this set of drinks. Like they tell you how to do your job, but as an artist, 
you're not really told. You get a job, they say, I want you to paint Disney on this wall, and it's up to you. When you do it, you tell them, okay, I'll come next Wednesday, I'll come around nine o'clock. You, you decide what paints you're gonna use, what colors, what theme, or whatever. So it's those types of criteria that makes you an independent contractor. So if you meet those criteria. Any questions on that? Does that all make sense? Where could you go to find that criteria in those like six items? Yeah, Kitty Googled it. Is that on the IRS website or? It's just like Nevada 123. Yeah, like yeah, just Google Nevada, Nevada 123. 123. On, on this slide here, and so I don't know if, if you guys will be putting this anywhere, but I just kind of uh, put the stuff that I'm going to talk about and right there it says Nevada 123. So, um, you know, as a little reminder, if you want. Um, this, so we looked at the um, W9, the W4, this is a Schedule C we'll talk about. This is what a 1099 looks like, if you've ever gotten them. Um, you know, it, it says it has your name and then who's paying you and then how much they're paying you. And then this is just kind of the topics we'll talk about. Um, there's a new rule law, I don't know, that just got passed. They're trying to uh, repeal it, appeal it, um, but otherwise it will go into effect. I don't know if it's in 22 or 23, I can look that up. But in the past, um, you know, there's so many gig workers, you know, they call it like Uber, DoorDash, people selling stuff on Etsy, like, you know, uh, all TaskRabbit, all these things. And in the past, if people paid you through Venmo, Cash App, Zelle, Stripe, <laughs> Apple Pay, like there's a million, they didn't have to send a 1099 to the IRS or to you unless you had over 200 transactions and over $20,000. Well, now it's over 600 bucks. Yeah, and so you're gonna get, they're gonna issue 1099s to everyone. I mean, who doesn't Venmo, you know, that much? So you're gonna be getting 1099s. The thing that people are complaining about is say I do a job and a client pays me 600 bucks, right? But then also say I go out to dinner with Daniel and I pay and he says, oh, I'll Venmo you my share. So he Venmos me the hundred bucks. Well, now I'm gonna get a 1099 for 700 bucks, right? But only 600 is taxable income. That other hundred, all those cabs we're sharing or Airbnb or meals or gifts that you're splitting and Venmoing people or, you know, cause you owe them, it's all gonna be on that 1099. So the responsibility is on you to make sure that you're able to prove to the IRS if you were audited the difference between what's income and what is you being reimbursed for something. I should have said the first thing I should have said, or Daniel should have said, I am a CPA, but I do not do tax returns. So anything I say cannot be like <laughs> relied upon. We do financial statements, we do bookkeeping. I do not do tax returns. So I know enough because I've been doing this for, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years. Um, we have over a hundred clients had my business since 2003 so I know enough but I'm not the final word the gospel you should get advice from your tax CPA or your lawyer <laughs> so now that that's done but anyway so what they're saying is really good is to have two accounts linked to your like all your Venmo profile so if somebody Venmos you then you can move it out to either your personal or your business account and even if you don't have a business, like if you decide not to set up a business, you're just doing this on the side, you could still have two bank accounts, you know, just open two bank accounts and, and they're both in your personal name, but you know this one bank account is just for your business, you know, so that you're accumulating all, any money you earn goes into that account, any, any supplies and everything you spend goes out of that account, it's gonna make it super easy for you at the end of the year to do your tax return. Cause it's all through that one account. It's not commingled. Cause nobody wants to have to go back through that stuff several years later and say, well, gosh, I remember Joey paid me and you know, it wasn't income. It was, you know, Airbnb or something. So it's just easier to, if you're gonna have a lot of that going through to set up two accounts and have it funneled through that account. But if that does pass, beware, you will be getting these 1099s if it's over $600 from any of these apps, third-party processors. Um, any questions on that? 
What's the best way to keep track of all of that information? Um, well, that's, I mean, the. I don't use a lot of the apps, but I know on Venmo, you can put, you know, what it is, like what you're, you know, a lot of people are funny, right? And they'll just put like a picture of a beer and a picture of a pizza. Well, when you download Venmo, those pictures, those icons don't come over. So there might be a way for you to add words to it, but I would recommend you download it, which I do like every month, I'll download Venmo and then I'll fill in. You know, you could look at the app, you see the pizza and beer and you just say, reimbursement for dinner or whatever um, but I, I know it's a hassle but it's so much easier then when it's fresh in your memory to just go into your Venmo app and capture that even if you screenshot a picture of it you know and then you would see the icons the beer and the pizza but it's just the, the most pizza. important thing is doing um, it every month I, I just thing is doing gave you these I know it seems silly but a lot of people get intimidated about keeping track of all their income and expenses and tax return and stuff when I was young um, you know I, I left young. home when I was 17 um, and had to, you know, go through college and work a couple jobs. To, you know, and I had a little book, like a composition a notebook, you know, that you used in, in college. And I would just, every every month at the start of the month, like I wrote in here, I would just write the month and then I would write my income that I made because I was like, you know, bartender or whatever. And so you, you're making tips and I would just write on one page all my income. So you just jot down, you know, somebody paid you 1099, you know, even if they paid you cash. Cash, you know, nine, um, you, know you just jot it down cash, you know, on the one side. On the other um, side, keep track of your expenses. You go to Home Depot and you have to buy paintbrushes. You know, you go to the art supply store and you buy paint. Like, you can put the receipt, stick it in here if you want, or just write 72 bucks, you know, paint. It doesn't have to be anything super fancy. It could be really simple. You could also use this for your mileage. We'll talk about that. But that's one thing the IRS is pretty strict on is you have to track your mileage you know all the time so there's apps on your phone that are super cool where um if you when you get in the car and you go to a job if you flag it as that's work um, it'll track it and from then on every time you drive to that location it'll flag it as that's work so you could either use an app or you could just write it down you know write down your odometer or write down, or write down 10 miles to whatever or, um, but you have to have, if you're ever audited, you have to have a mileage law for business. Um, and then you can even, you know, if you write each month, then you can just come to the front and just summarize each month. You know, we'll talk about this when we get to the estimated quarterly tax payments, but it doesn't have to be fancy. It's like super simple. How much came in, how much went out. You know, the difference is going to be your income. So um, any other questions? On that? Just on a comment, uh, I'm an independent contractor. I have to many, many years. So the rule of thumb is if you do it weekly and you decide like on Saturday at 4 o'clock, 4 to 5, I'm just going to capture all that on a spreadsheet or on Excel. Just put it there on that particular day, put it on Sundays, once a week, because if you wait a month trying to remember what happened three weeks ago, four weeks ago, it's a little challenging. Yeah. So if you create a habit of doing it weekly, and then it becomes kind of like this natural thing that you do. By the time you get to your taxes, you file quarterly taxes or yearly taxes, however you do it. Right. It just simplifies that process. Yeah. You're kind of like, oh, it's so cool, I got it all done. And uh, also to remember those identifiers, like the little pizza, who was it? Tom, and now you have three friends named Tom. Which Tom was it, <laughs> right? Right. So you want to make sure that you identify uh, and, and clear that on a weekly basis rather than right. No, that's a good idea. In fact, Friday night, before you get to go out and party, you say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the work first. Let me see how much money I have to party and figure it out. You know, okay, I did good. I've got, you know, an extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks I can party okay. with. So, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, okay, workers' comp, we talked about that. The 1040, that's a typical tax return that everyone has to file. Um, the Schedule C is the one that um, if you had, if you do, um, if you're an independent contractor and you want to deduct your, so if people give you 1099s, you get a 1099 for $1,000, you have to report that on your tax return. 
Um, if that's all it is, is you have that thousand, that's it. But um, you can deduct all these other expenses, you know. So cost of sales is the main one, and that's what did it cost you to make that sale? So if you're an artist and they paid you, you you had to buy paint, you had to buy paint brushes, you know, whatever it was that, you know, canvases or whatever it is. So your cost of sales, you've got any advertising. So if you have a website, business cards, um, flyers, you know, whatever you do for advertising, um, you know, this is, a, car and truck expenses, that's the one that I told you, you have to, you know, really keep track of your mileage. Um, uh, contract labor, if you hire someone else and you pay them, then you're now responsible to do a 1099 to them, right? So if you hire somebody for a job and you pay them over $600, you have to 1099 them if you want to take them as a deduction. So you'll have them fill out the W-9 and then you'll keep track of it and you'll put it on here. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff, insurance, um, office expense, you know, you buy supplies, any rent or lease, repairs and maintenance, supplies. So as long as you keep track of it and as long as it was required for you to make that income, um, it's deductible. Um, I think there's a cap in you use your, your home and you do all the work from home, you have a computer and you exchange emails from a potential client design drawings or not from home. I think there's a cap, I can't remember the amount, four for four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. That's a deduction also. Yeah, I don't know about that, but I do know that um, you're allowed to take the square footage mm -hmm. like um, so if you have an office in your house and that's where you do all your work you know on the computer there and say that's a hundred square feet and your place is a thousand square feet so that's ten percent so then you can take ten percent of your utilities ten percent of your rent you know ten percent of everything and i'm pretty sure that on here it walks you through that calculation yeah um so there's you know the the thing you have to be careful about and i do have that written down um here um, hobby loss rules. So um, you do all this, but at some point, if you're not making income, so if you're Schedule C, right, you brought in 2000 bucks, but it cost you 2500 bucks to get that and you take a deduction. At some point, they're gonna, the IRS could say, this isn't a business, this is a hobby, because <laughs> you're not making money off of it. You're losing money. So when you first start out, a lot of people will start out, you know, on Etsy or whatever, and you may lose money, because, you know, it, it takes you to a while to build up that base, and you've got to invest in certain things. But at some point, the IRS could say, you've been taking a, a loss for the last five years on this, it isn't a business, it's a hobby, and we're not gonna let you write it off anymore. So it is something to be aware of that you do wanna show some income. Um, Schedule C, EIN. So EIN, you can all uh, do this under your own social security number. You don't have to get, you know, uh, EIN, but some people, after it becomes, um, where you're doing it a lot, you, you know, you're making a good living out of it, you might want to get an EIN. Um, so you, on the IRS website, um, they give you a special, you know, just like your social security number, it's a number that identifies your business. And then you wouldn't do the Schedule C anymore, you would actually do a tax return for that business. So a lot of people do it. Um, Schedule C, sometimes they say that you have um, a much greater likelihood of being audited under a Schedule C than you do if you had an EIN and had a business. Um, I don't know, you know what the other benefits are. And if you ov make over a certain amount, then there's also an S Corp election that you could take. But again, get advice from your tax CPA. Um, your W-2, um, you pay Social Security and Medicare, and then your employer pays the other half. So you only pay half, like seven and a half, seven, seven and a half percent. But if you're self-employed, you will have to pay self-employment tax, which is 15.3 percent. 
So what I usually tell people is when you're a 1099, if you get a 1099 for $1,000, if you want to be safe, take 200 bucks, take 20% is what I do, take 200 bucks and throw it into a savings account so that it's there for you to pay the IRS on. Because the worst thing is to have all these 1099s throughout the end of the year, and then at, you go to do your tax return and you owe a ton of money. So whereas when you're W-2, they take it out of your paycheck every single pay period, the 1099, it's up to you to uh, send it in. So like um, we always advise people 20% of whatever you get. You get 500 bucks, um, put 100 bucks in a savings account so that it's there to pay your taxes. Um, the estimated quarterly tax payments and the irs.gov. Um, this is really cool. You go on irs.gov, you could Google anything on there. And, um, but they also have a page where you can make your payments. So like what I said here is you could just, you know, weekly, you summarize this, and then after the end of the quarter, this would show how much you made, and then you take 20% of it, and then you just go to irs.gov, forward slash payments, you put in your social security number, your information, and you put in your bank account routing number, and you make your payment. And so the IRS does want you to make quarterly payments, otherwise they can penalize you, because they say, well, you know, if you're, if you get a paycheck, right, you're paying the IRS every single pay period. So the IRS shouldn't have to wait till you do your tax return at the end of the year for you to pay them. They want you paying them quarterly. So any questions on that? No? Um, so then separate business versus personal. Um, that's the most important thing. The hardest thing is when people commingle everything. You know, when you use the same debit card or the same credit card for business and personal. Um, you know, I know it might be like depending on you know, how much volume you do, but it is nice if you can have two bank accounts, one that you've earmarked as business, if you could have two credit cards, you know, um, when you're, you know, going somewhere, you're going to Target and you're buying some supplies, ring that up under the business credit card and then pay for your clothing or food or whatever under the other credit card. So just, you know, try and keep them separate. Even if you pay for it together, maybe take that receipt, add up the ones that are business, you know, put the dollar amount there so that you have it for later. Um, receipts, I think the new rule is you don't have to keep receipts if it's under $75 maybe. Um, you used to have to keep receipts for everything, but I think now it's under $75. So if it's over that, you buy something that's over that, do keep that receipt so that you have it. Um, track the mileage, we talked about that. Um, you do, it. Ha you have to, be able to document, I went to this job, you know, then from there I had to go to Home Depot to buy supplies, then I had to go, you know, wherever and keep track of the mileage. And you can deduct it, I think right now it's 58.5 58, 58 cents for business and charitable. If you do any volunteer work, you can also deduct those miles and that's 14 cents. So keep track of, you know, if you do any charity work. Your cell phone, same thing. A lot of people think, oh, I can deduct my entire cell phone. You can't. Um, you can only deduct the portion that's business. So, um, you know, not that they're gonna come in and say, prove it to me, but just kind of, you know, um, you don't want where you never take a business call, you never do anything business on your cell phone, but then you're deducting it. So say I use it 25% for business and you can deduct 25%. Um, the home office we talked about, you know, based on square footage, or maybe there's a standard deduction for that. Clothing, a lot of people think that they can deduct clothing. You cannot. Um, the rule with clothing is if it's something you could never, ever wear out on the street, like for normal use, then you can deduct it. So if you, you know, get a Graffiti Park logo t-shirt, but you can wear it out on a Friday night, you can wear it to the gym, you're not allowed to deduct it. So there's very few, you know, I know like I do some restaurants, so chefs, when they wear those chef coats and they have them um, like labeled with the logo of the restaurant, then that's something that the IRS allows because you're not gonna go out on a date, you know, in your 
chef coat with your logo, the company logo. Yeah, you never know. So, um, so those are usually the only things. Scrubs, that might be. Yeah, yeah, because nobody would really <laughs> wear their, yeah. So that might be um, deductible. Tools, supplies, equipment, you can deduct those. If it's over $2,500, you're supposed to capitalize it and depreciate it. Uh, meals, meals, it's constantly changing the laws, but I think right now 50% uh, deductible, but again, it has to be a legitimate reason. You can't just, you know, go through the drive through by yourself and take a deduction. But if you have a business meeting with somebody, you're talking about the job that, you know, they're gonna hire you for or whatever, um, then you can, again, make sure that you document, you know, what you did and um, the hobby loss rules we talked about. And then the last thing is just the benefits of reporting. A lot of people will say, well, why do I want to pay taxes on this? Why do I want to report this? But it's a double-edged sword. If you don't report it, then you have no verifiable income. And someday you may want to get a mortgage, you may want to get a loan, um, you may want to sell your business. Like some people create a business, you know, on Etsy or whatever, and they have all this following. But if, if you want to sell that so somebody can buy that embroidery business or art business or whatever, you don't, you haven't filed a legitimate return that says how much money you make. So how is somebody going to pay you for something that's not reportable? And then too, when COVID happened, a lot of self-employed people, you know, they couldn't get unemployment because they hadn't properly reported. They couldn't get PPP, you know, so, you know, me personally, I love the country we live in and I love the, you know, what's provided. So I, want to do my fair share and and pay so you know i advise reporting it like you know so you don't have to look over your shoulder like you know when are they going to catch up with you but there is a lot of benefits to reporting it that will benefit you in the long run especially as you're starting out um you know and as you grow and want to you know do things with that reportable income so that's it any questions No, I thought I Mile told IQ. you Mile IQ. Mile IQ. They give you like a free one to where you can go in and add all the things in there. It does make it pay, like pay monthly for it to auto like track your miles and stuff like she's talking about. You know? Yeah, maybe just go to the app store and put in miles. I'm sure they all want to charge for, you know, but maybe there's some basic stuff that it'll give you. Or, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Keep I mean. <laughs> yeah. Straight up. Yeah, that's, you know, what I, or even on your phone, just open a notes, you know, and when you get somewhere, yeah, just put it in notes. And then again, like it, he says, if you do it weekly, what, you're going to have five at most right. to figure out. So. Yeah, something that I do is like get a receipt from the gas station, you know, how you, you can get a receipt and friends in the, between that one and the next one, you see the mileage. Because you, uh, you can write down the mileage on your receipt. What is the mileage of my car today at three o'clock? I fill the tank, so many miles in my car, and then when you have to fill it up again, then you have your mileage right there. I have those. Right. I just get it and then I put it in this. Yep. Thing. I put it in the ashtray. Yep. There you go. My truck. And then, and then, so I just have like every gas receipt for the year. Is your quick, fast truck you Yeah. So again, it's easier to start these habits when you're starting out, you know, um, because, you know, hopefully all of you someday, you know, the volume will be high and there'll be a lot there. And it's just easier if you create these good habits, um, you know, initially. Front door. What are the benefits of doing this? So say I track all of my stuff, I make sure I keep all of my receipts and all that stuff. At the end of the year, what is the benefit of doing that? Like does the 20% average tax payment go down? No, I mean, by tracking your expenses, yeah, then you're going to deduct it, right? So if you don't keep track of anything at all, and all of a sudden, the end of the year, by January 31st, all these companies mail you these 1099s, right? Like the one you weren't expecting. Then all of a sudden, you're like, oh my gosh, I owe all this money, right? But if you had written it down and kept track of it and just assume that anyone that pays you, they're going to 1099 you because you're required to report that income whether or not they 1099 you. If you do a job that's 
you know they're not going to 1099 you because it's under the $600, but you're still required to report that income. Um, and, you know, the benefit of it, like we talked about, is so you can say, wow, you know, last year on my side gig, I only made 3000 And then, you know, this year I made 8000 And next year I'm going to make fifteen. you know. And at some point you can see, hey, this is, you know, I can quit my W-2 job and do this full time. So it is really good to track it. And then tracking your expenses, again, that's stuff that you forget. You would totally forget that, you know, you went to Home Depot or you went to Kinko's and had some stuff print, printed. So it's just, you know, easier to keep track of it daily, weekly, monthly, so that you pay less tax at the end of the year. You know, you pay the right amount, but you have the money set aside is what I think is so important because, you know, a lot of these are side gigs. So when you get that $1,000, it's a lot easier right then to set aside the $200 for taxes and you know you can go splurge on the 800 but if you spend all that thousand it's really hard to come up with that money at the end of the year to pay the IRS so there I I was surprised this year when a tax CPA had told um, had told us that um, so uh, like if you buy, usually the rule is like, say you have two cars and one car is just for work and one car is just for personal, right? Um, I thought you can deduct 100% of that business car that's just for work because I have this other car that I use for personal, you know? I'm not gonna drive around a big van or whatever when I'm going out on Friday night. But they said, no, you still had to have a mileage log even though that car was 100% business. So with the cell phone, I would say they could probably say the same rule, prove to me that it's just business, but if you only use it for business, you'd be able to because every phone number on there, every text would be all about business. You know, there'd be no personal phone calls because you're only gonna give that phone number out to clients, you know? So I would say yes. Is there any profit margin where like as a solo artist one would have to like get like a personal business license or like contracting license or anything like that um, legally? Because um, like that would put us in like a tax bracket like if we were to making strictly off of um, art gigs. So would, would there be a price bracket or like something one would have to get a business license or like some independent license or something like that in order to properly file a tax? So I think the correct answer, again, I'm not a tax CPA, but I think the correct answer is you're supposed to regardless. Like I think if you were talking to like a government official, they would want you to have that because the states want you to register with them and they also want you to register for sales tax. I mean, you know what sales tax is. So, you know, at, at one point, I think there was a huge push where they were, you know, going after a certain industry and making them go out and get licenses, you know, because none of them were. Um, so I think the answer is you're supposed to regardless, you know, you should have a business with the state of Nevada, you know, again, too, like, are you doing it out of your home? You're technically not supposed to, there are certain, you know, things you're not really supposed to do out of your home, you know what I mean? Like you couldn't be a nail technician out of your home, you're not supposed to, it's supposed to be a licensed establishment. So I think the right answer is you should on anything, but really you don't really need, <coughs> I shouldn't say that, a, a lot of people, most people do the Schedule C until it gets to a point that they're like, wow, you know? I mean, me included, I did accounting on the side. I had a full-time job and I did accounting on the side for a while until I realized, geez, the clients are coming out of the woodwork. This is like serious. I should get an EIN and make this a legitimate business. So, but I think when you start out, you're just getting your feet wet, you know, like a lot of people are not gonna set up a business. It, you know, it does cost, I think it's $325 you pay to the state. Um, maybe 50 bucks for sales and use tax or something, and then you might have to have an extra tax return done. So it's not, you know, cheap, um, but uh, it's probably something that you should do, like at some point when you say, like, I, this is what I want to do. Like, this is my long-term goal is to, you know, pursue this. Thank you, Mom. 
My pleasure.